All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today. My name is John McMullen. I'm the executive director of the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub. And we wanna welcome you to our May 2022 edition of our Collaboration Cafe webinar series. This is sponsored by the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub with support from NSF. Um, I am very happy today to be joined by Dr. Ivo Dinoff from the University of Michigan as my co-host. Uh, he is one of our co-PIs on this award uh, and the University of Michigan leads our big data in health uh, priority theme area. So very appropriate to have Ivo joining us. Uh, we're also very happy to have Dr. Afenglu Mao from the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy uh, joining today. Uh, Dr. Mao is a cognizant program officer on the uh, SCH solicitation that we'll be talking about today. So thank you for being here as well. Um, we also have a lightning talk today presented by Dr. Franco DeLugo from Lawrence Technological University in Michigan, uh, who is also uh, a longtime partner of, of the hub as well. Uh, both Franco and Evo are part of our uh, big data in health theme, but also uh, involved in the advanced computational neuroscience network community that started during phase one uh, of the hub as well. Um, and finally, I want to uh, uh, welcome some prior awardees of the uh, SCH uh, program who are uh, gracious enough to join today and talk about their experiences uh, with the program. So thanks everybody for being here today. Uh, let's go ahead and, and get into just some background for folks who are unfamiliar with uh, the hub or this series. Um, we are uh, a part of the, the national network of hubs uh, that NSF uh, has funded for several years now, uh, but we're focused on the 12 state Midwest region uh, with a number of uh, different priority areas that you can see here today. We're focused on the sort of alignment of big data and health along with other data science uh, and cyber infrastructure topics. So great fit for the hub community that we have. Uh, but this series includes uh, uh, solicitations from a number of different agencies and program tracks that align with the work that we do. So we hope that you'll come back for future sessions uh, on other topics. All right, so I won't go through all of the details here. These slides are available uh, on our website. Uh, feel free to, to grab those and uh, dig into the details, but uh, this is a monthly webinar series that really is focused on building communities of researchers and, and practitioners who would like to uh, develop new collaborations and partnerships uh, in the region. And so we welcome you all here today and, and uh, please come back uh, anytime that you would like to, to have this conversation. We have a number of resources uh, beyond the webinar on our website for this series, including uh, some shared documents that, that include uh, prior awards so that you can get a sense of, of what people have already done in this particular space that we talk about. Uh, and we have a Slack community as well and, and an archive of these recordings for you to check out as well. Um, we are happy to partner uh, with folks on proposal development, uh, either in this space or, or other topics. Uh, and so feel free to reach out to us if you have interest uh, in uh, leveraging some of the, the hub's uh, engagement and, and other strengths uh, for your activities. So let's just dive right into the solicitation today, given the, the time that we have here. Uh, we're focused on a, uh, a joint program that NSF and NIH have collaborated on. Uh, we're, we're calling it SCH because it has a very long uh, name, uh, but really it looks at the intersection of uh, health and biomedical research, uh, coupled with things like AI and data science uh, and other smart health elements uh, as well. So uh, if you look at the, the program goals from the solicitation, this is really focused on uh, inter interdisciplinary work, uh, bringing together partners from across uh, different disciplines and, and focus areas to, to really do transformative high-risk work. Um, so uh, 
looking at some of the other details from the solicitation here, I, I would encourage you to read through uh, the, the full uh, announcement if you're proposing to this program, but we'll just touch on some of the highlights here to give you a sense of what the scope of this looks like. So these are four-year uh, awards. Uh, up to uh, $1.2 million uh, over that period, so roughly $300,000 a year uh, budget. Um, and NSF uh, estimates that they will make roughly 10 to 16 awards uh, each year of the program. So that's not guaranteed, but that's the guidance that they give us. Um, there is no requirement for a letter of intent or a pre-proposal for this, but uh, it's very typical to, to reach out to a program officer who uh, is uh, uh, familiar with this solicitation to uh, talk about your ideas and, and make sure that you are aligned with uh, the program goals, particularly in this case, given that it uh, uh, addresses both NSF uh, um, STEM uh, technology sorts of goals, but also the NIH uh, health goals as well. And we'll talk about some of the, the unique features of the, the program in a moment here. Uh, in terms of eligibility, this uh, is open to uh, academic institutions as well as uh, nonprofit organizations and non-academic organizations. So there is some flexibility on who can apply to these, uh, these awards. Um, so that includes things like uh, research institutes and museums and other uh, non-degree uh, de granting institutions. There is a limit on the number of proposals that you can be on uh, in each proposal cycle. Uh, and so you're limited to two proposals as a PI, co-PI, project director, uh, senior personnel, or consultant. So they, they limit uh, the, the total number of those regardless of whatever role uh, you're taking there. Um, there also is a restriction uh, from the NSF side of things here uh, that if you've proposed uh, something substantially similar to NIH in the past 37 months, uh, that is ineligible with some exceptions to uh, being proposed to this program. So again, it's really important to read the solicitation, make sure that you understand what the constraints are and uh, whether your idea fits within this particular framework. Uh, Dr. Mao, do you want to, to say anything else about the, the basic eligibility uh, issues here at this point? Uh, it is not special, just uh, like people who are eligible to normal R01, they should be able to apply to this program. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So let's dig in a little bit to some of the, the guidance that we're given in the solicitation. Um, NSF in particular uh, recently has really uh, added quite a bit of, of language to their solicitations that helps proposers understand, uh, particularly in these multidisciplinary kinds of spaces, what exactly it is that they are looking for. Um, so the one of the first things that you'll notice in this solicitation is that not only is it a, a joint program between the two agencies, there's multiple directorates at NSF who are interested in these uh, proposals, and there's multiple institutes at NIH uh, who are also uh, interested in, in receiving proposals. And so uh, taking a look at um, where uh, other people who, whose work is similar to yours may have been funded uh, previously, uh, looking at you know prior awards in this space can be helpful there. Uh, again, talking with program officers about the best fit uh, is, a, is a good idea as well. Um, very much uh, focused on integrative and uh, convergent, you know, translational kinds of approaches here. There's some language about um, making fundamental contributions to two or more disciplines. Uh, so again, very much um, trying to, to bridge uh, some of the, the discrete spaces here and, and bring together different threads of research. So they give us some specific guidance about um, looking at uh, areas that are computationally focused, so maybe more of the data science uh, side of things. Uh, 
within the, the biomedical space, uh, but also some human uh, dimensions as well. So potentially uh, looking at how uh, humans interact with technologies in this particular uh, domain uh, and, and how uh, there may be cognitive dimensions or behavioral factors that uh, may come into play here. So uh, pretty wide latitude, but there is some restriction about um, not having um, clinical trial uh, elements to this. Um, you can have human uh, participation in, in various ways, but uh, no clinical trials in this particular uh, program. All right, some other uh, very interesting guidance that was given in the solicitation. Um, there's a, a seven different research themes that are mentioned. Uh, again, a good idea to, to read through this section of the solicitation because um, they're sort of telling you uh, a, a number of areas that make sense to them. So if, if they receive a proposal in this space, this aligns with their uh, interests and their objectives for the program. Uh, that, that doesn't exclude other ideas and it doesn't exclude, you know, uh, ideas that cut across these boundaries, but they give you some really interesting text um, to uh, dig into for, for each of these seven areas. And, you know, you can see that they span quite a significant range of uh, topics from infrastructure to uh, even social dimensions of, of health, like health disparities. Um, when I'm looking at this through uh, my typical lens, which is more of, uh, of an NSF um, uh, proposer, um, this looks very similar to me to a, a typical NSF uh, proposal. You have some standard elements like the project description and, and the budget um, uh, and some, some typical supplementary documents, but there definitely are some, some obvious uh, NIH elements here as well. Um, uh, the, the collaboration plan, for example, uh, is one difference to this solicitation from many other uh, NSF uh, research programs, given that they really want you to focus on this multidisciplinary uh, research dimension. So talking specifically about who your collaborators are, uh, what the plan is to work together to address this, this new and novel uh, problem that you're trying to solve uh, and, and what the, the specific uh, means are that you're going to use to do that um, uh, looks to be very important here. Um, they very helpfully also provide a, a proposal preparation checklist. Um, so this includes, um, specific things that they want to see within the project description, for example, or within other elements of the proposal. So definitely take a look at that. They're telling you uh, exactly what they want you to put in the proposal. Uh, and uh, in, in many cases, if you don't have that present, um, that sort of eliminates you from competition there. Uh, one thing that was not clear to me, I, I don't know if uh, Dr. Mao, you can speak to this or not, um, NSF is moving away from the fast lane system that they have used for many years to submit proposals, uh, uh, but that is still present in this particular solicitation. So um, I would check with your uh, sponsored research office or your program director to, to make sure that you're submitting that into the correct uh, system for this. Well, I cannot speak for NSF, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so I don't know. So if you are going to submit in this year or next year, which, uh, which system you are going to use, but that has been a wildly smart review from NSF. So far, I'm still using Fastlane. Very good. Thank you. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the, the NIH specific elements here in a moment. But yeah, again, check with your, your NSF program officer before you submit to make sure that you are uh, submitting to the correct system. My understanding is that, that Fastlane will go away completely uh, very soon. And so uh, you will have to migrate uh, for some proposal that you submit in the near term. All right, what else did they tell us in the solicitation that we need to know about? Um, one thing that is, is always very helpful is 
some understanding of how they're going to evaluate your um, proposal in terms of the review process. Um, NSF has some standard uh, merit review principles that they always include in their solicitations. Um, and in, in cases like this where there's unique elements, they will have uh, additional criteria that are specific to this topic. And so in this case, we have the collaboration and management plan that I mentioned, uh, but we also have some review criteria that NIH is very interested in as well. Um, some of these look very standard to uh, NIH solicitations. Um, for example, if you have uh, human subjects that are participating, you need to uh, document the, the plan for protecting them and, and work through your IRB locally, things like that. Um, one thing that, that uh, jumped out to me from the solicitation is that it, it sounds like the initial review will go through the NSF uh, review process. Uh, and for those proposals that are selected for uh, funding um, through NIH, uh, those proposal subset of proposers will have to um, resubmit that proposal into the NIH um, system separately. Uh, am I am I stating that correctly, Dr. Mao? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I do prepare a few slides because that we I, I re, we indeed receive a lot of questions on how the the proposals to be transferred to NIH. So I prepared a, a few slides. To talk about that, if I can, I can share my slides uh, after yeah, your absolutely. presentation. Absolutely, this, this would be a great time to do that. So let me go ahead and make you a, a co-host so that you can share your uh, screen here. Thank and I'll you. Stop sharing mine as well. So, so John, are you done with your presentation? If or you want, you want me just to share the slides on how the proposals are transferred to NIH. Yeah, feel free to share whatever you would like. Uh, if you would rather us to post the slides later, that's fine too, but uh, whatever you would prefer. Yeah, uh, let you finish your presentation first. Then I will go through mine. Okay, yeah, I, I am basically finished with my overview at this point, um, so, so go right ahead. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> As we're waiting for that, if folks have questions, feel free to post those in the chat as we go along here, but we'll be moving into the question period in, in just a moment. So John, can you see my screen? I can, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, John. So although John told me slides is not necessary, but I indeed prepared a few to like, streamline my, my understanding of all the information I want to deliver to, to you guys. So yeah, before I start, so I want to uh, do a marketing work. So if you guys are attending this ESISMB, so we are, we are organizing a special track in ISMB 2022, ETC Medicine. So it should be close to you guys. And we will have three hours. And in this track, we will have four PIs, previous Smart Health PIs that are going to talk about how they developed their proposals. And we will also have a mock review. So it is different from a typical NSF review or a typical NIH review because we will have both NSF program directors and NIH scientific review officers. So you will see why this is uh, different, how it's going on. And we will also have a panel discussion. So um, we will have both the leaders from both NSF and NHSF. We will have Wendy, so who is a leader of the Smart Health Program. We will have Dana. Dana was the previous leader. Uh, so she's still co-lead this program with me at NHSF. We will also have our uh, lead scientific review officer for this program. So you will have the opportunity to talk to, the, talk to them directly and ask questions to them. Uh, so this is the special track we're going to hold in this year, uh, July. So <clears throat> Before I talk about Smart Connected Health, I also want to talk about our office. So you guys may have the question, why I'm sitting in this meeting, I'm 
need this, this program at large. You, you guys may never heard about our office before because our office is new office. So I think our office is established in a little bit more than two years. So, and before our office did this program, it was another NH office called OPSSR, who is leading uh, this program at NH5 and Dr. Dana Wolf Hill, who was leading and he's still co-leading this program with me. So our, basically the responsibility of our office is to implement NH data science strategic plan. And we have five goals, and the, in the third goal, we have more sub goals. And in the sub goals, we have multiple implementation tactics and smart health programs fall into this one to develop, uh, to contribute to the interdisciplinary research uh, projects between mathematics, statistics, computer science, engineering, and physics, and the biomedicine. So that is why, because we see a lot of projects in smart health fall, in, fall into this category. <clears throat> so I think John talked a, a lot about the program itself. So I may skip some of the slides. Uh, for example, you know, this is the interagency program and it's, the purpose is to develop uh, research projects between interdisciplinary projects, between traditional STEM uh, science and the biomedical research. Um, so the interdiscipline team it is in, important. So this is the favorite slide from Wendy. So he is the leader at NSXS. So uh, the X-axis is application, like Steve Jobs. He did a lot, contributed a lot, and developed an iPhone. That's great contribution in application side, but that's little con contribution in fundamental uh, research, like understanding of science. So where access is the understanding of the basic understanding of the world, the science. So born, he contributed a lot, but he has little contribution on application side. So Louis Buster contributed in both. So this is the area focused, targeted, aimed in this program. So we expect in the proposal, you want to make uh, progress in both side, application side and basic understanding of the science side. So then come to the key requirement. This is very important. When you develop a proposal, you have to make fundamental contribution to two or more disciplines. Basically, we expect one in computer science, engineering, statistics, mathematics, traditional STEM science, and the other one is in biomedical research. So I think John mentioned about the total funding is 1.2 million for four years. So a little history about this program. So this program was established back in 2013. And at that time, we only have six NH ICOs uh, signed this program. And it has been reissued four times. So the last reissue was 2021. And I uh, put that notice into NH uh, notice system. So you can say the name has been changing and but we are still using the, the short name SCH. And I think next time we are talking about the reissue, uh, probably next time we will use they call it smart health. So but the short name we are still the SCH. <clears throat> so this uh, seven times, I think John had talked about it. I don't want to read it through. So this is the leadership team. So so Wendy, so you guys may know her because she has been leading this program for a long time, nine, nine years, because started from back to 2013. So she's still working with me and other people uh, in, in this program. And Dana, she, she was the previous leader. So before our office become a uh, leader of this program, and Dana was the leader from uh, OBSSR. But after, after that, he, she moved to NCI as a program officer. So Natalia is our lead scientific review officer. So she will organize other scientific review officers and uh, make the proper arrangements in the review meetings. So we do have a lot of other people. So as you can see, we have multiple program officers from different ICs. Uh, so they are all my point of contact. If we have anything to do, any information, 
or they want to bring any applications to NIH. So this is people who are working this program. <clears throat> so this is uh, the timeline and the uh, tasks we have to complete in this year, FY22. So this is a very typical one. So this is the slides I mentioned, uh, how we, we brought uh, NSF proposals to NIH. So as you can see, the first, I think this year is 20, last year, November 10th was the submission due date. So after you submit and the first big task is for NSF to, to prepare the review meeting because NSF, uh, they have to recruit, uh, recruit uh, PIs, professors in, into their review panels. And then they will have a review, panel review meeting. And like this year, it uh, lasted about two weeks. Um, so in this review meeting, we will have, uh, it is a typical NSF review meeting, but we will have NIH program officers and the NIH scientific review officers, they will be sitting in each meeting, um, especially scientific review officers, because we will need the criteria uh, required in, in NIH, for example, I think in NSF, they use high competitive, competitive and low competitive to score, to rank their proposals. But in NIH, we use the numeric score from one to nine. So we will have scientific review officers to ask the reviewers to give a numeric score according to our criteria. And we will ask, also ask them to uh, provide their evaluation on like human, animals, those kind of specific criteria required by NIH. So, <clears throat> so after the review is completed and they have NIH scores, and NIH program officers from different ICs, and they will have to decide which one to, to bring to NIH. And there is a, a lot of small tasks because uh, from 2020, 2021, our office began to provide co-funding. So uh, this was the first time uh, an OD office to provide co-funding because before that, so the IC has to provide all the funding. But from 2021, our office began to provide co-funding. It's slightly like 40% of the uh, total funding in NIH is provided, will be provided or has already been provided by our office. Uh, and it's, it's expected to be last for multiple years. So uh, the IC Smart Health Program Officers, they have to apply co-funding from office, from our office. Our office need to review and make a rec funding recommendation and our office director has to approve the funding recommendation. So after we approve their co-funding, normally it's about 50% of each uh, award the IC office, they will decide if they are going to uh, bring back to bring the applications to uh, NIH or they don't. So because some small uh, ICs, they don't have a lot of funding. So our co-funding will be very important for them to make their decision. So after the so NIH has made all the decisions, so I will coordinate with Wendy to tell her which one has been decided to go to NIH, then Wendy will initiate the transferring process. So she will send an email to the PI, then I will follow up, send all the instructions to the PI, and they have to follow my instruction to resubmit their application to NIH. Basically, that is a simple sandwich method. You just need to simply sandwich your original one, especially the research, uh, uh, research path, so I think in NSF, they have a project summary path. And in NIH, we have a research path. Uh, so you just simply copy, uh, sandwich that. So you don't need to do any change. So after you resubmit to NIH, and then our scientific review officer will create all the information, complete all the paperwork we need in NIH. Then it will be sent to the NIH council because in NSF, they don't have some council. We have a council, so the council has to approve. So the next like this year, uh, so all the smart health uh, applications are sent to May Council. So most of them, most of ICs will make their final decision this month uh, or next month. 
So after they, the, the, the IC council makes their decision and our office will begin to transfer the money, our co-funded money to the IC because we normally contribute half of the money uh, to the final award. But before their council approve the award, so we will not start that process because <laughs> anything could happen. So after their council approve the award, so we will begin to transfer the money to IC and their grant management office will begin to make the uh, award. So this is the whole process. So uh, another thing that I want to update, so John just mentioned, so uh, they will have 10 to 16 awards made each year. I think that is NSF set. So after our office step in, take over this project, this program, I think at the NIH past said, we, the number of uh, award made at NIH has been significantly in, increased. Uh, last year, NIH brought 17, 17 uh, applications here. Uh, and basically for all the proposals we uh, bring back to NIH, we will make a award. Basically that is 100%. So if there's anything which is not awarded that is a big, a big problem at all that. And this year, <clears throat> FR22, uh, we brought 13, 13 applications. So uh, basically we are going to make 13 awards. So uh, so that is a big increase at NH set. So now we will have like, uh, like we, um, a similar number of awards made at NH set. But before they make much more, NH make, make much, much, much more award than us, basically they make like uh, two thirds and NH only make one third. But now we have like half, half. So, <clears throat> so, so this is the, our, the role ODI has playing in this program. So, so I, I, I am the leader at uh, ODSS to lead this program. So basically I provide a correlation between NH, NSF and all NH ICs and the CSR so because there's a lot of coordination work we have to do with them. And all of it also provide co-funding. So on average, we provide co-funding to H8, new smart health award each year. So that has been last year, two years. Last year, we provided co-funding to seven of them. This year, we provided co-funding to line of uh, uh, smart health award. And our annual budget is 5 million. So in four years, because in four years, in average the number we are going to support in each year will be like 32 and 150K each. That's close to 5 million. So this is our role in this program. Mm. Yeah, that is everything I want to share today. Great, thank you very much. Does anyone have uh, questions for Dr. Mao? I see one in the chat from uh, Evo. Uh, I think that's one of the questions that I had is, is how does that decision get made uh, about whether NSF or NIH receives the, the proposal? Is that, is that a joint review panel that makes that initial decision? So is that, okay, that is, uh, so can you see your question again? I don't think I got it. Penglo, uh, this is Ivo Dinov. I, I just wanted to, uh, very quick, uh, artist, can one submit either proposal through the fast lane or does it have to be through grants.gov? I don't know because the proposal uh, submitted to NSF. So I don't know which system uh, they are using, but in the, uh, in the meetings I attended, I think a few months ago, I attended their review meeting. So I'm still using fast name, which means they are still using fast name, but it could be okay. transferred to grants.gov anytime, because I think at NH we have, you have multiple ways to submit a proposal to NH. We, you can use grants.gov. You can also use like assist NH. So, so I'm not sure what they are going to use. And the second question is, when a proposal is submitted, right, how is it mm -hmm. routed to a panel? And I mean, <clears throat> is the cover letter somehow indicating which panel needs to review it? Or how, how does an institute pick up? I mean, <laughs> it seems like a two-tier process that I, I, I just can't fathom how it works in practice. Sorry, I don't know the answer. Sorry for that, because that part it was always handed at NSF. I think Wendy probably she is the person to make the decision which panel which the, the proposal is going. Because when we step in, 
the first the biggest event we step in is the review meeting. So when we step in, the proposal has already been assigned to panels. So I really don't know how that was handled at NSF, but I think Wendy should play an important role in that process. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like no matter what the, the internal process is, everyone is submitting to NSF. So proposers do not have to make a choice. Should I send it to NSF? Should I send it to NIH? No. That decision no. is already made for you. Yeah. Yeah. NSF are obviously the, uh, doing a heavy lift. We receive all the proposals, we organize review meetings. So we are, yes, we are doing a lot of work. <laughs> I would say at this point, it, um, since all proposals are going to NSF initially, I would highly recommend using research.gov rather than Fastlane. Um, that seems to be NSF's pr preference. <clears throat> so. Definitely want to check with your program officer before you submit and, and probably your sponsored research office as well. I mean, in the, in the solicitation, they do mention research.gov. And so that would definitely be a safe option. All right, well, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I want to uh, pause the recording here and we'll move into our open discussion with our uh, prior awardees as well. Um, we will restart the, the recording for our lightning talk in just a moment. Can you see my uh, slides? Yes. All right. So I apologize for the long title. It's actually five minutes to read the title. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is, a, um, this is a, I thank you, uh, John and, 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 and the Hub very much for the, uh, for the seed grant that we received because it was very um, important for us to create a network uh, to develop uh, a nice I use proposal. This is an educational kind of work that I'm going to present today. And so I'm very grateful because it was really inspiring and the network is expanding and it's very important for me from a PUI, primarily undergraduate institutions to have these wonderful collaborations with many institutions. Uh, and really the hub was really instrumental in this. So my presentation is about Cure, which is course-based undergraduate research experience, and specifically in computational neuroscience as a tool to inclusivity in STEM education. So um, we know that uh, STEM education is still not very inclusive, right? And we can see that for uh, a lot of dropouts, especially from the uh, minoritized communities of STEM students, especially Black and La La Latino communities. And we also know that um, undergraduate research experience works in order to reduce the gap between uh, uh, traditional and non-traditional uh, students in, in STEM. But we also know that when the model of research is an inclusive model, which, uh, which allows the inclusion of many students at the same time, works better than the exclusive model, which you have a one-to-one -one uh, relationship between uh, the student and uh, the mentor. So um, in particular, if we are talking about uh, inclusivity and accessibility, we can easily say that neuroscience is really not in a very, in between, uh, between the sciences, one of the most exclusive fields. And this is also because neuroscience data requires a lot of money, time and resources. And uh, so it's very difficult for institutions that don't have a big hospital um, uh, affiliated with the institution, with the educational institutions to get uh, access for students to uh, the, um, for example, imaging facilities and uh, also to data acquisition and uh, which is almost always limited to faculty or and graduate students. So um, lately, there, there has been like a, a, a flourishing of uh, computational um, uh, uh, platforms, cloud computing platforms that allow actually access to uh, students and any anyone because these are um, open um, open data platforms in which you can uh, uh, share your uh, share or use online repositories. You can do big data analysis, you can do data mining, you can actually even do hypothesis testing. But still, we have a problem. 
because normally this is done at a level of complexity that is pretty inaccessible to undergraduate students. So our, um, our uh, challenge and opportunity was to combine uh, um, cloud computing um, uh, resources with uh, the Cure program with which at Lawrence Tech we are transforming undergraduate curricula to nurture inclusive excellence in STEM through course based research experience. So if you combine the two things, you have no selection, no self selection, no extracurricular time, research ownership of all the students in the classroom, but also you have the access to many resources that were unthinkable at an undergraduate level before, right? So, uh, Cure or CRE at LTU is, uh, is interesting because we have more than 30 instructors doing course-based research experience. So the scale is really relevant because we have a lot of different courses in all sciences and it's very heterogeneous because it involves all the fields in, uh, within the arts and science uh, college. So what um, Cure works Essentially, we developed some principles in which every class has to have the discovery component. So original research should be inclusive because everybody can participate and uh, dissemination. So it's actually ambitious because we try always to have uh, uh, venues of uh, even publication, even peer reviewed publications with undergrad students. So um, yeah, um, and I want to give you an example of this. Uh, which is the example that we uh, we produce with this seed grant from the Midwest Big Data Hub. Uh, so we developed um, courses, essentially Cree courses at LTU, and we are now working on a, on a disseminate, on a propagate, let's say, our model to uh, partner uh, minority serving institutions in the United States. Uh, we are also building up um, um, an infrastructure for instructor training and outreach. And, uh, and we are developing this uh, through a nice network that involves several entities. We are developing um, a, a collaborative proposal that we're going to submit uh, this summer to NSF is uh, the IU's um, uh, proposal. So now this is what, uh, this is just an idea, right? It's not that is only applicable to neuroscience and is not only uh, applicable to neuroscience in this way. But this, I think it was a smart way. We work essentially with volumetry of the, of the brain areas. Why volumetry? Because volumes is something that is very accessible as a, as a kind of basic concept. What is the volume? A volume is, is a, it, is a physical space, right? So, and it's very easy for an undergraduate student to understand that different modules in the brain can have different uh, sizes, right? So we work on that and with real data, we use, uh, we extracted volumes uh, from publicly available data sets through free server and brain life. And uh, we tested the hypothesis about age and disease related morphometry brain changes. And then uh, the result was a very cool introduction to anatomy and function of the brain to undergraduate students with no previous experience in neuroscience. Uh, we, we developed with the students an intuitive understanding of what the meaning of research is, right? And a sense of ownership of the results that they get because it's their own results, because they did their own analysis of Previously scanned brains, yes, but you know these are all public data. It is their own research and uh, teamwork. Uh, and and uh, I, I really like this definition. Uh, it's not mine, but it's an unlimited discovery playground because you can really find new results. So now I just want to show you an example. This is a uh, this is a data set comparison between a, a, co a cocaine user disease. Uh, um, uh, subjects and two healthy control data sets. And then you, um, so what the students uh, notice is that, you know, that the, the gray uh, line is the, is the volumes in, uh, 
in cubic millimeters of the different areas of the brain and is immediately noticeable that, uh, that there is some regions of the brain that are actually smaller in volume than uh, in, a, in the cocaine user uh, sample than in the uh, healthy controlled sample of, uh, of brains. So this is very important in my opinion to undergraduate students because they can immediately really go into a realm of, uh, of actual research with, uh, with a kind of great understanding and simple statistical analysis of what they are doing. Again, I want to, um, to point out the fact that this is undergraduate students with limited experience in neuroscience and even psychology. And um, so uh, the most, you know, the, I, I just share here uh, uh, one uh, um, word cloud that says that the experience was defined by the, by, by the students as very interesting, but also frustrating. There is a lot of bumps, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, difficulties in understanding how to process data in the cloud computing platform. And sometimes the, uh, it requires a lot of time, many times it crashes. So it's, it's really a big experience in, uh, in science um, that uh, I think has a really good perspectives in the future, especially if we can relate in a network uh, the, uh, the work of the um, mostly researchers in R1 institutions that know how to do the stuff, they, they direct the cloud infrastructure and, um, and, the, uh, and the CRI community, which can offer pedagogical models because we have a lot of experience, for example, here at Lawrence Tech on how to do course-based research experience with students. And uh, this is a very important for characteristics for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, also this relates immediately to uh, a community of uh, primarily undergraduate institutions in the United States, minority serving institution, and also an international network because it provides an open access to all the students. And uh, that's it. I hope I, I was not too long. Thanks very much, Franco. That was terrific. Uh, glad to have you as a partner on the hub and, and it's really valuable work that you're doing here. Um, I know that we're a little bit uh, over time here, so if folks need to jump off, uh, we understand, but uh, happy to stay on and, and take some questions as well. So Franco, we have a question in the chat here about information infrastructure. Uh, how, how exactly are you defining that for this particular project? Okay, um, so in uh, uh, information infrastructure is a very important part of what we want to do because, uh, let me see now, I, I see the chat, I don't see uh, the, the people. Um, it's, it's important to, to define the scale, for example, of how big we want to be Right, and we need definitely, um, um, possibly, the intervention of a of a structure like a MOOC, like a massive online open course, right, in order to be able to uh, coordinate the work within and uh, within the different institutions that are going to be involved. So for this uh, goal, we are involving. We where we are talking to Neuromatch Academy. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with them. Oh, they have a, a very large network of, uh, of uh, researchers and students in all the planet, 100 countries with 13 languages. So it's not only involving the United States, but there are many partners in, in many parts of the world. And, and this is very functional for us, right? To put together our efforts because it's, uh, if you want to coordinate the work of so many groups of, uh, of students and, and faculty, you need to, um, to have the, the infrastructure to do that. In this term, I, 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 this is what I meant with information infrastructure. Um, um, I had uh, something else to say about this. Um, obviously, it's very important that, you know, Neuromatch Academy and as many other MOOCs, right, providers, they are working mostly outside of the uh, undergraduate 
realm <laughs> in the United States. So it's very important that for us, this program is actually embedded in actual courses that are credit providers for the students, because this is not like a separated education that is not, is not, is actually the goal is to provide a, uh, a pipeline for the next professionals in neuroscience, right? And it's very important to capture this pipeline in the first moments of, uh, of academic education. So it's not like the smart computer savvy student that learns alone on YouTube or Coursera, right? This is not what is our goal. Our goal is to be really well in, in great relationship with, with uh, the actual institutions. And uh, this is a lot of networking that's necessary. That's great, Franco, thank you. Great, thank you very yeah. much. So just to wrap up here, I wanna invite people to join us next month, uh, June 16th, we'll be talking about an NSF program targeted at early career researchers, uh, particularly those at institutions with limited funding for uh, infrastructure. So this is the CRII program. Uh, feel free to, to come back for that or, or to share this with your colleagues. But thanks everybody for joining today. Really appreciate your participation. And thanks again, Franco, to your, uh, for your talk just now and uh, really inspiring to see the work that you're doing there. Thank you very uh, thanks, much. Thanks again to uh, Dr. Liu and Dr. Lee for your input today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.